All right, I'm going to go ahead and get started, folks. I know there's a few people filtering in here, but uh, welcome to uh, our webinar here on Will Moscow Really Pay? Uh, predictions from Simulated Sanction Scenarios. Uh, really excited about this uh, webinar. It's on a very you know, important and uh, current topic. And I think it puts a lot of uh, trade economists uh, like myself and Mark Mundler and Simon Evident here uh, in an interesting sort of situation. So we're used to sort of talking about how trade barriers and protectionism and things like that uh, you know, hinder global commerce and uh, are bad for economic growth and investment and development and things like that. Uh, but we have a sort of much more interesting situation here relative to, you know, our, our usual environment, which is that Russia um, has chosen to invade Ukraine. Um, and we, as, as economists and policymakers and politicians are looking at ways, you know, to try and punish Russia um, and sort of make them, you know, pay for this action without actually putting uh, troops on the ground from NATO countries and, and, and most of the West. And so <clears throat> we have uh, Mark Mundler and Simon Evanet here who've done some really interesting work trying to simulate sort of different uh, possibilities in how trade protection, tariffs, uh, and revoking Russia's most favored nation status or normal trade relations with a lot of uh, countries in the West uh, may impact their economy and also will impact the economies of you know, the rest of the world, which is you know, important to kind of thinking about whether or not these sanctions will be sustainable. So I'll let them sort of tell us more about this, but I want to introduce both of our speakers. Um, first, uh, first up, we'll have um, Mark Mundler. Mark Mundler is a professor here uh, in the economics department at the University of California, San Diego. Um, sorry, I'm getting to your bio here. Um, he's also a research professor at the IFO Institute in Germany and a guest professor at the University of St. Gallen and a research associate at the National Bureau of Economic Research um, in Cambridge, Massachusetts. He's published in many of the leading journals in economics on globalization and its consequences for local industries, labor markets, firm dynamics, and entrepreneurship. Uh, our second speaker will be Simon Evanet, um, <clears throat> who's a professor of international trade and economic development that specializes in how governments tilt the commercial playing field in favor of local firms. Um, he also, during the global financial crisis, started Global Trade Alert, which is actually how I sort of came to know um, a lot of Simon's work uh, to sort of monitor uh, different forms of protectionism that rose up uh, in the in the in the Great Recession and the financial crisis. Um, he is a professor at the University of St. Gallen. Um, he's served uh, as an, <clears throat> sorry, as a World Bank official twice. He's been a non-resident senior fellow um, in the Economic Studies Program at the Brookings Institution and a member of the UK Competi uh, sorry, Competition Commission. So without further ado, I'm gonna turn it over to Mark who has some slides for us and uh, he'll talk for seven or eight minutes and then uh, Simon will jump in as well. All right, Mark, you have the floor. Thanks so much, Kyle. I hope the slides are visible. They are. Okay, perfect. Thank you, Kyle, for the kind words of introduction. Thank you, CCD, for hosting Simon and me. So we will talk about um, the move in the global policy community from making Moscow pay to now more serious questions about how to isolate Russia in the long term. Um, I'll start out with um, a summary of what we can do in our first C brief. And Simon then will take over and, and present uh, the findings from our more recent second C brief on these issues. So the, the two main questions that have um, um, been on everyone's mind is, is how to punish Russia for the Russia's invasion of Ukraine. And then uh, more recently and more relevantly, how to make the punishment last so as to both serve as a deterrence for future um, bad behavior and as a, a punishment for past bad behavior. The first question uh, basically was answered in, in, in ways to make Moscow pay immediately. The first sanctions imposed were financial ones, exclusion of Russian banks from the international payment system and the freezing of Russian 
um, um, foreign reserves uh, in, held in foreign accounts. Then came a number of trade measures, and um, we will point to a sometimes not so prominent, but uh, arguably one of the most lasting and most promising measures, namely self-imposed transfer interventions, uh, largely in the private sector. Uh, the, the big question is how to make those punishments stick and last. Uh, um, as we've seen, the financial sanctions have already dissipated. The ruble has regained its value quickly within about a month uh, to, to the level it used to have prior to the uh, sanctions. So how to isolate Russia in the medium and long term? And uh, one answer was a quarter of the World Trade Organization's membership said we'll um, um, revoke, as Kyle mentioned, the most favored nations principle, status of Russia and uh, support trade interventions. There were a number of private sector initiatives, companies withdrawing from Russia, either shutting down their operations, at least temporarily, and as uh, Simon will present, um, private sector initiatives in the transport sector, where shipping companies refuse to serve uh, Russian ports. Now, the problem, I think, uh, that plagues that second question, how to make things last, is that natural economic forces will blunt those initial interventions, especially the financial ones. Um, the, the Russian war economy will uh, invest less and consume less. And uh, quite naturally, the trade balance will improve. And we've seen that the Russian trade balance actually improved even under the sanctions and, um, and blunt those financial measures quite quickly. The ruble, as I mentioned, recovered. So what we need to look for, and I think by the time Simon and I are done with our scenarios. Um, what we need in order to make the punishment last and Russia isolated is broad based measures across many industries and across many countries in order to have an impact that's meaningful and lasting. So we use a model for this uh, coming out of a project and initiative here at UC San Diego. We call it the C model uh, within the framework of a globalization and prosperity lab that helps us handle these, these tough questions. We have 170 industries in this model, which is quite detailed for um, that kind of field. We have realistic government budgets, including expenditures on um, subsidies uh, if they come around, or in this case here, collection of tariff revenues when um, the, the tariff punishments are petered out. Uh, we have 43 countries for which we can actually model detailed supply chains. And then the rest of the world, I call it territories here, including uh, countries and, and uh, semi-autonomous uh, regions um, with less detailed information on supply chains. It's uh, as we had planned it, button ready. We have uh, worked on this model for, for a long time uh, to get it ready. And then as we were preparing our first sea brief, Simon and I, um, with the team here, uh, we Russia invaded Ukraine and we changed course and uh, decided to rather not add the last uh, little details, but just hit the button already and put the model to work. The way it's designed is for all the percentage changes, the adjustments, the sensitivities with which industries expand or shrink or factors move within countries between industries, factors for production, that is labor and capital in our model mostly. Um, those things, those issues, those, those aspects of the model, they are uh, um, tied to the time period when we think the world economy was rather tranquil and when we have the best data, including on supply chains. That's the period mid, in the mid 2010s. Um, and uh, importantly, that just gives us the percentage changes or the adjustments the economies undergo we can underlie them obviously with more recent data, assuming that the percentage responses will be as in the mid 2010s, um, but the actual trade flows today can be quite different. And we can then predict how incomes change, trade flows change, prices, and how labor and capital moves. Importantly here, there are still some issues we need to clarify. So capital, for example, in the current version of the model cannot leave a country. Um, um, it, we, we have capital flows that are fixed, but we cannot adjust them at the moment. So that the, there's still some things in the model that, that we will work on, but I think it's ready for, for these prime time questions on Russia's um, um, economy. 
Uh, importantly, here's the global map. We cover most of the countries involved in both the coalition against Russia, the, the coalition of countries imposing the sanctions, and, and Russia and its neighboring countries, and the main economies, um, Brazil, India, China here, uh, or if you, if you think of developing countries like the Mint case, we have Mexico, Indonesia, and Turkey with detailed supply chains, but the, the, the countries in white, for those, we only have more aggregate numbers and we need to uh, deal with them a little differently. How important are these countries for Russia? Well, uh, three countries really stand out. China is the leading trade partner for Russia. Um, and so this is from the Russian perspective, looking out, who are the most country, most important countries for us? Germany as well within Europe, but all of Europe is quite important in some. And then in, in the Americas, the United States stand out. Interestingly, Latin America and Africa and the Middle East are not uh, on Russia's monitor for either strong exports or strong imports, and um, neither is South Asia. So what do we do? We asked uh, right after uh, the, the invasion, what if uh, we followed Canada, who took the lead on one of the policy initiatives, namely set a tariff on all of Russian exports uh, of uh, Canada's choice at the time, 35%. Or scenario two, what if everyone followed the United States and banned Russian oil and gas? Now I put the word ban here in, in quotation marks, why? The, the way we simulate that is that it's not an outright ban on everything, which sounded uh, somewhat unrealistic at the time. So we modeled that as a 100% tariff, basically a doubling of the price of Russian oil and gas for all the importing countries. And then finally do, do both. Um, so what I'm gonna show you here, and I apologize for the, the small font, um, is the outcome of our first simulation. Uh, Simon and I realized that well, these graphs are perfect for the sea briefs. They might be less than perfect for, for a display in a webinar. Let me sh tell you what these show before you, you spoil your eyesight. Uh, so the first set of columns here uh, going down, that's if uh, Canada went alone. The second is if the EU went alone. The third is if um, the United States went alone. The fourth, Canada alone. And then the fifth, the most important, if the EU as it happened, and the G7 joined forces. So G7 beyond EU is the United States, Canada, Japan, and now the United Kingdom after Brexit, uh, plus all EU members. That's the fifth bar here, which, which is clearly giving us the most impact. So if uh, the first scenario is if everyone imposed a 35% tariff on Russian uh, shipments uh, to those countries. If Canada went alone, it would have a minor impact on, this is the top panel here, on Russian GDP. Why? Because Canada is just not an important trade partner for Russia. The EU would have most uh, impact uh, in percentage change in, in trade levels, in, a, in trade flows in addition. So the EU is a strong candidate, but if it acted alone with a 35% tariff uh, cut about uh, 0.6 of 1% of Russian GDP, and I'll come to the magnitude in a minute, and, and shift about 250,000 jobs in Russia out of the shrinking industries into other industries in the medium term. And, but clearly, the most impact comes if EU and G7, as they did, join forces. Then we predict about a 1% cut of Russian GDP in the medium term once the economy adjusts. Uh, about 400,000 jobs lost that have to relocate to some other industries within Russia, and um, um, a, a significant reduction in trade. How much would the EU hurt itself and the G7 on average the GDP there would only drop by 0.05%. So these numbers suggest that economies are extremely flexible. And uh, Simon will present a few more numbers on that. Uh, that raised a lot of questions among us. How flexible will these economies really be? And even if we make them less flexible than in this benchmark model where every uh, substitution is essentially a one for one, uh, if you make things less substitutable, uh, even then we find relatively small numbers. So what this suggests is that just a few countries acting is not going to do much because Russia's economy will respond. And you could view this relocation of labor actually, uh, uh, that is a move of workers in Russia to other industries, is actually a sign of the flexibility of the industries. Um, and, and the impact is not as large. It's about a 1% GDP cut here. 
You can now ask, well, what if we did other things in addition? We follow the United States and ban oil and gas, in our case, with the doubling of the price to 100% tariff. Then you get a little more power. So the three bars here are the scenario one, just the 35% tariff on everything. The second bar, oil and gas embargo alone, and the third bar, the combination of the two. We'd lose about a percent of GDP in, in Russia, and, um, which is maybe large, maybe small, depending on your perspective. So one way to put it in perspective is to ask how much did Russia benefit from, say, membership in the World Trade Organization? That was calculated about a 3.5% GDP gain every year in eternity. So cutting 1% of that is not that little. Um, and there are papers out there um, that ask how effective have been sanctions in general over the last four decades. And one cornerstone estimate is 4% GDP cuts is what you can expect on average from sanctioning other countries on, uh, on broad base. So 1% uh, of those average 4% in the last three and a half decades or so is, is a substantive number in that, that view. But it clearly isn't uh, what some had made out a, a huge amount of punishment. B because again, um, it, it's only a few countries and only a few industries now with a severe ban like the, the Russian oil and gas industry. So uh, the, the total numbers are the EU would hurt itself about by 0.06%. Their flexibility obviously helps. Um, this is a somewhat small number and we'll be happy to discuss uh, why we think it's not all that implausible, um, but it's a contentious number. So um, some of you have followed the debate maybe in Europe, especially in Germany, there uh, some scenarios predict much heavier, uh, much heavier toll. And a job loss in the EU of about 170,000 workers having to move, 220,000 total in the EU and GS7, um, very little compared to the half million in Russia, but still a substantive number. Now, let me point to one last thing, and then I head over to Simon, as I, I, I said before. So if we only did the oil and gas ban, you see that more than 500,000, 570,000 workers in the United States, would, uh, sorry, in Russia, uh, would lose their jobs and have to move on, both in the oil and gas industry or in, in downstream industries. If we do a broader based ban, there would be less labor displacement in Russia. And I think that's one of the indications why the flexibility of these economies is a crucial ingredient in the simulations and in the policies. If we make it only one industry, oil and gas, then there's a lot of disruption, but it also is a signal how the economy adjusts. It adjusts tremendously. It, 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 it moves workers out of these industries into others quite flexibly in, in the medium term. That's our simulation horizon. And um, whereas if you do it broad based, 35% uh, tariff on every good, the, the economy in Russia has less of a chance to evade the single sector focus. So that already is a indication what kinds of policies will have most impact, namely broad based ones, as I started out saying, that involve many countries and also broad based ones that cover many industries at the same time, isolated, uh, heavy bands might in the medium term be less effective than we hoped. Good, that is my part. Let me now hand over to Simon. So I'll stop my sharing. And Simon, I think you can just launch the slide deck from your side. Thank you, Mark. Uh, let me build on what you've said. So the question, of course, is what's really going on here? Uh, we have with the G7 and the EU um, countries which are responsible for half of, um, for buying half of Russia's exports. If we had gone back 10 or 15 years, that would, uh, that percentage would have risen to 60% and maybe the effects would have been larger. Uh, so we have a, a substantial number of countries which have refused to uh, sanction uh, Russia. In fact, only a quarter of the WTO membership has chosen to do this. This then led us to ask, uh, also to, to look around to see whether there would be other factors which could uh, uh, reduce Russian GDP through its isolation that has followed uh, the invasion. And here a historical precedent uh, uh, came uh, to mind, and that was from the apartheid era in South Africa. Of course, the South African economy at the time uh, 
quite quite commodity intensive, just like the Russian one, did have a manufacturing uh, component, uh, was significantly isolated uh, from its uh, trading partners once the sanctions regime uh, accelerated in particular in the 1980s. And so the question arose as to whether or not uh, you know, the, the trade sanctions were the only factor which was uh, relevant. And in fact, digging into the history of South, the South African sanctions, it became clear uh, that in fact, uh, transport, international transportation linkages had weakened significantly. As trade volumes dried up, uh, the economies of scale that we see in shipping resulted in higher shipping costs uh, being faced by South Africa. And in fact, if you look at the 70s compared to the 80s and 90s, uh, transportation costs almost double, uh, international transportation costs double for South Africa. And when the apartheid ends, transportation costs fall by about a third uh, as well. So this then um, made us look around, well, is there any evidence of um, the international shipping companies uh, taking potentially similar action? And there was. So the Western shipping groups such as Maersk and others announced uh, that they would only continue to supply essential goods to, um, to uh, Russian ports on their ships. And furthermore, Maersk even went further and said that it's going to sell off its operations in uh, Russia, such was uh, its um, decision to disengage. Now, looking at the international transportation or shipping cost data, we see that globally such data peaked in quarter four of last year and has fallen back somewhat. But industry publications suggest that intra-European transport costs, in particular those two Russian ports, have risen considerably since the invasion. So for that reason, we essentially asked the question, could um, international transportation costs deliver the punch that tariffs are not? And one reason for thinking that they might is that these, there's a small number of global shipping, uh, 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 global shipping groups, and they are, if they decide to withdraw services from shipping to Russia from all locations, then it's quite possible that the imports and the exports out of Russia would be affected by higher transportation costs. And so we explored this point uh, considerably uh, in, in a series of uh, simulations that I'd like to take you through uh, now. And so just as a benchmark, remember Mark showed us that uh, the Canada style tariff increases, which ultimately the G7 and the EU committed to implement, these 35% uh, these, uh, tariff increases um, would reduce Russian GDP by 0.9%. Well, it turns out that uh, 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 tar uh, transportation costs, or rather shipping costs to be more precise, if they rise just 4.5%, then uh, this will have the same effect as those 35% tariffs. And again, I think this is precisely because it's the uh, transportation cost increases apply to a wider base of trade flows. If we see in South Africa the same type of, um, uh, uh, of uh, uh, transportation costs that we saw in South Africa during the apartheid regime, then there will be uh, more than a 4% um, reduction in Russian GDP. And as Mark highlighted, that 4% number is significant because uh, analyses of sanctions regimes have shown that uh, a 4% GDP drop from comprehensive sanctions is what is typically witnessed in the first two years of uh, financial trade and other sanctions. We also uh, looked at um, what, what would it take to hit the 4% threshold and a 27.4% transportation cost or shipping cost increase would uh, do that. And that's very much within the range of the South African experience. Now, Mark mentioned uh, that an important parameter in our, uh, in our computational model relates to uh, the ease with which resources are allocated or reallocated across the economy. And so the numbers that I've given you are the ones where there is the greatest reallocation, greatest uh, uh, intensity of reallocation or ease of reallocation, let's put it that way. If we, ad, uh, if we make different assumptions on the elasticities of substitution and we restrict that so there's less easy reallocation, then the transportation cost uh, increases that you need to hit the 4% harm uh, is a, are actually smaller. So if anything, uh, this suggests uh, that isolating Russia through um, transportation uh, costs links or cutting or severing those links uh, would potentially have an even greater effect. Uh, 
So what we can see here then is that it may be that the uh, shipping, shipping lines will do more damage potentially to Russian GDP over the medium term if these sanctions stick. Now, in our second sea brief, uh, we also simulated what would happen under slightly different scenarios. Not every um, scenario, not every sector in the uh, in the economy ships at all. So we separated out between the sectors where there is the products are shipped and where they are not. And then among the sectors uh, which are shipped, there are different modes of shipping, and uh, we simulated different permutations of transportation costs. Uh, increases there. And what was interesting, and I refer you to the uh, results in the second sea brief, is that uh, finding a 2% and 3% reductions in Russian GDP are exceptionally common with modest increases in transportation costs. And so, again, this reinforces the impression uh, that severing shipping li line linkages is possibly the more potent, uh, potent weapon. Let me draw together then the arguments uh, and pose a number of questions which we might want to take up in the discussion. And that is, of course, that uh, is, is first to start by asking, what is the strategic purpose served by revoking Russia's most favored nation status and enabling its trading partners, therefore, to raise their tariffs on, on uh, Russian goods? Uh, we've heard before, you know, oh, is this strategy designed to punish Russia? Is it designed to deter uh, Russia, if it is there to deter Russia for perhaps taking even further action in Ukraine, what is the implicit theory of change of anything? What, what level of harm do we think will make any difference? Or is the right way to think about this that the reason the trade sanctions were put into place is because it would be incongruous to have financial sanctions in place, condemn Russia, support uh, Ukraine with uh, various types of military equipment, and still, quote, trade with the enemy. And so maybe the, you know, the trade sanctions are there, we shouldn't expect too much of them, but they are part of what is seen as a coherent package. And so we might want to reflect on what the contribution of the trade sanctions are uh, in light of the findings that we have in our study. The second um, point, which I think is important, and I'm speaking to you here from Geneva today, and uh, it's quite interesting talking to diplomatic delegations here, a number of the Western delegations are surprised that not more countries have signed up to um, condemning and, and sanctioning Russia. And so the question really might arise, if uh, having a greater trade sanctions impact on Russia requires more uh, countries to join the coalition, what incentives can be offered to encourage um, the widening of that coalition? And of course, you might also ask the question, what counter incentives could Russia offer uh, to keep um, countries out of the sanctioning coalition as well. So that might be a, another uh, question we might want to pursue. And the last question uh, that, we, uh, that we might want to ask is based on the following and uh, starting a premise. The, the argument has been made that uh, these sanctions are likely to remain in place so long as Mr. Putin is in power in Russia, largely on the, the argument being that uh, the people do not think that uh, this, uh, this, uh, this individual is going to change his approach to international relations and, uh, uh, and, and alike. If that is the case, we have to sustain these um, sanctions over the longer term. And if the, our results are right and, the sh and severing the shipping costs or shipping linkages is, uh, the, prin is the principal trade related way in which we can uh, punish the Russian uh, uh, economy, then how do we preserve the incentives for the shipping lines to keep those links sever severed. Let's not forget that the global shipping industry for much of the past decade has made next to no money. They've had uh, uh, lots of excess capacity and very low global freight rates. In the last year or so, that has not been true. The freight rates have been much higher, profits have been much higher. But what happens if, as often happens in this sector, global freight rates go down again, and these companies become desperate for revenues. Uh, under, and under those circumstances, they may well then decide to re-engage with uh, shipping goods to and from Russia. And, uh, and so, of course, the force of the sanctions regime would be uh, diminished. So uh, how, do I, how, how can the sanctioning governments keep the Western uh, shipping companies online, uh, on site? And uh, for those of you who've read today's Financial Times, you will have seen Gillian Tett's article where, interestingly, she makes exactly the same point 
that we have done actually, which is that if the transportation costs and the insurance costs of shipping goods in and out of uh, Russia is maintained, then this will have an adverse effect. But that again, just begs the question, how long the incentives to maintain uh, those uh, private sector driven sanctions uh, will remain in force. So let me hand it over to Kyle and uh, thank you very much for your, the opportunity to present uh, at this CCD webinar. Okay. Uh, hey, th thanks very much. Uh, that was really um, kind of fascinating to kind of see how all, all of these different packages can come together and, and, and how, how much, or in some cases, I think surprising to me how little uh, some, some of the proposed sanctions, you know, how little of an impact they, they may actually have. Um, so we're going to take uh, questions from the Q&A. So if you're in the audience, uh, feel free to kind of type type your questions in, and I'll um, get, get those to Mark and Simon. Um, I want to lead off with kind of one question of my own here. Um, and I think there's been a lot of discussion, particularly in Germany, about these oil and gas bans. And a lot of some, let me say, some economists, I think, have advocated, look, we don't need to ban the oil and gas. Uh, we can put tariffs on um, on these imports and at least uh, push the price down that, that Russia is receiving. And at least we co collect some revenue from that. And so my question is, in some of these scenarios that you've done where you know there's across the board 35% tariffs, have you tried to calculate how much tariff revenue would that would generate? And is it even close to the magnitudes we would need to somehow like compensate you know, individuals in these economies, say Germany, uh, that are being impacted by high energy prices and high gas prices, um, you know, could we kind of rebate that back in some sort of cash transfers? And uh, so, so that's the question: Is your model kind of capable of handling that, or just off the off the off the cuff? Is are these large tariff revenues that maybe, as economists, maybe we think we can redistribute uh, to make to make this more sustainable? Simon, you want to take it? Should I? How do we do the question assignment? <laughs> Mark, why don't you do this? Because I know you've, you've thought a lot about that. Yeah, the, uh, so, the so the answer, the simple answer to the simple question is yes, it's doable. We okay. frankly did not extract that number. There are many numbers you can extract, price changes, uh, um, uh, similarly, um, which we haven't. Um, and we have not focused on the, the sanctioning economies that much, the coalition countries. Why? Well, um, if the economies are as flexible as we say, then we have an underestimate for how bad they will be for Russia. But we will probably also understate how bad they are for the coalition countries. So we are careful not to push too far here. In the short run, things might be a little worse and the, and the compensation need a little larger. So we didn't want to put these numbers there. Our focus has been how much damage we can instill on Russia. Not so much how easily uh, we can compensate at home. That said, um, the, the ban on oil and gas that's been discussed, that is a zero revenue proposition. Um, so there we are clearly uh, not doing anything wrong. Those, um, if a ban is an outright ban, not just 100% tariff, as we say, um, nothing to compensate. In the 35% tariff, so for Canada, that the Russian trade, which preceded it, the Russian trade model is so minuscule that it, it would probably generate very little, but also the harm to Canada would be minuscule because it depends to uh, only a minor extent on imports from Russia or anything. Yeah, in, in, I guess, the European countries, and, and we have some slides actually how important these things are for Europe, we, we, we um, uh, foresaw some of these questions. So let me jump to, to one of those. So how important uh, are some of these destinations for Russia. And uh, uh, interestingly, Europe is clearly an important destination for Russian gas and oil, but the, the main important block here is China. Um, and so um, the, the uh, uh, um, uh, uh, impact that Europe has is not gonna be that high. That's a related question. More importantly to your point is, um, uh, let's go to oil and gas here. Uh, who, who, how dependent are these countries on Russia? And while Germany and, and to some extent Italy and France have discussed uh, how much compensation there is needed, if you take oil and gas together, they're actually not that highly dependent. Germany is highly dependent on gas, not on oil. In some other countries, it's the other way around. 
On average, the most hit will be the Eastern European countries. So here you see Poland, but also Belarus. And um, so for them, it's most important. And uh, um, uh, some of the countries who are most hit actually would not, um, uh, if, if Russia had to ship less oil um, through the other sanctions we discussed on shipping, um, the, the most important countries would not even necessarily be the sanctioning ones. So that's a long answer to say that we haven't exactly compu compu uh, computed the, the tariff revenue uh, collected, um, but the, for most countries, it's not clear that they would be high enough to compensate if the economies were really unflexible. And um, the flexibility is a big question we haven't really answered comprehensively. Good, sorry, that's as good as it gets. Okay, thanks for that. Uh, I'm gonna take a question from the Q&A. Our, uh, our colleague, James Rausch asks uh, whether or not you simulated the impact of reduced Russian and Ukrainian wheat exports on developing countries. And I'll add to that as well. If you have just thought about the, the destruction of, of capital and capacity in the Ukraine, it's, or it, I should say the U, in Ukraine, um, and whether or not you know th that that is part of the simulation or we're kind of taking the economies as is uh, at some point in time. Mark, maybe I can take uh, this one. So we did not simulate the impact of um, the export bans or export reductions of, for wheat uh, out of Ukraine or Russia. I would say that uh, just to highlight to Jim that next Tuesday, the World Bank is actually going to release an analysis which has done exactly that. And they have price estimates uh, on um, you know, the increase in global prices and which developing countries are most affected. So I, I think that type of really granular study uh, probably best done in a potentially a partial equilibrium framework. But um, we didn't uh, cover that uh, in our in our work. And secondly, um, you, the Ukraine is not one of, sorry, I should say Ukraine, not the Ukraine. Ukraine is not one of the countries which is in our framework. They're part of the rest of the world. So uh, it's a bit hard to separate out the impact on the capital stock there. Um, so that's, that is a potential limitation. So to give Jim a little sense though, I, I put up the map here for bulk shipments out of Russia. Um, in those bulk shipments are many things. There's fertilizer just as much as the wheat uh, Jim asked about, or um, 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 lumber and other products, even ores, uh, uh, minerals. And um, you can tell that indeed the countries most affected would be uh, um, those just neighboring Russia. Um, Ukraine itself uh, would suffer um, from, from that uh, reduced shipment. And, and a few in the Middle East and, and North Africa um, would, would uh, suffer, and that's mostly the grain shipments. Um, so we, did, we, we have a, you know, a little uh, assessment of the relevance of uh, these countries for Russia, or conversely, how much they would suffer if the shipment didn't happen. But we can't really put simple numbers on them precisely for the reason Simon mentioned, because if we wanna be very careful about supply chains, grain is lacking, that means the downstream uh, food products will be more expensive. If you really wanna map out how wheat prices translate down the supply chain, um, we have very limited data, unfortunately, for all of the MENA economies. Um, the only one that might step in as a representative country is Turkey and, and perhaps Indonesia, which, for which we have supply chain information. Um, and we know that Indonesia, affected by the high vegetable oil prices, um, largely the lack of shipping out of Ukraine, they are taking measures to prevent uh, palm oil exports. Um, so, so those things we can do. Um, in a more limited fashion, but the broad based question on say all the Middle East and North Africa, that is very hard in the, if you don't have the supply chains ready. And we don't, these countries don't report them well. Okay, thank you. Um, let me try to, we have several questions from uh, Ricardo Tavares. I'm gonna try to consolidate them a bit, um, but he's asking, uh, you know, what, does transportation actually cover in the model if we're talking about uh, maritime shipping or are we talking roads and trains? Um, and kind of in addition to that, in the South African experience, like where, where did these kind of sort of higher transport cost frictions uh, arise, I guess, you know, his, historically? Um, and Simon, I, I did read that uh, Gillian Tett 
uh, op-ed. I read it yesterday, actually. Uh, and, and she was arguing that we should, a lot of these vessels are flagged in Greece so that the EU could potentially just ban uh, EU vessels from operating in Russia. And that would do a lot, uh, but also talking about you know insurance. And I guess, so all of those things, uh, from my perspective, I think would definitely increase transport costs. But I guess from your model's perspective, sort of how, how do these kind of policy levels translate into the transport costs that, that you're modeling, I guess? And, and I think gets it kind of what Ricardo Tavares is asking and, and then my, my elaboration here. So Mark, do you want to start with the modeling of the transport costs in the... In the okay, area? let me start that right, and then, then you can complete me yeah. this time. So we, we, did, we did go into individual sectors. So the idea here is in the model, we do not observe which mode goods ship with exactly. So some goods that could ship on a container potentially might also have shipped by railroad um, yeah, to neighboring countries of Russia or by airplane for that matter. But uh, so, so the way we depart, uh, we approach this question is this. We, we uh, in the, the scenarios that I put out here, where we can simulate somewhere between three and uh, some between two and 4% GDP uh, um, effects on Russia. We say, let's suppose that the accumulation of existing measures, or at least announced measures that uh, G7 and EU will complete, including tariffs, including financial frictions, and including um, uh, bans of uh, Russian ships, Russian flagships from ports in Europe, they say amount to about a 10% increase in transportation costs in the medium term. And then if we on top of it succeed in excluding additional shipments, where would we get the most effect? And we discern basically by industry. We say, uh, um, if the accumulation of the, all these effects resulted in say a 30% increase in the dry bulk shipping sector, then how much could we expect if they, that was complemented by a say 10% increase the baseline on oil and gas tankers and a 30% increase in container ships. Now these uh, section segments here we choose because they're very different in the way they operate. So in the, in the transport industry, they, they sometimes joke, they say container shipping is like buses. You load them with lots of different containers from different sources or like lots of different passengers and then you ship them on given routes. Whereas dry bulk and, 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 and other bulk shipping modes are um, much like taxis. Uh, the ships go around and they say, see in which port which uh, they can get to fill up their, their loads and, and, and steam out the, a port to the next one. But they're basically on call um, and they often just serve single customers. Typically, they only serve single customers, just like taxis take only one passenger. So these are very different uh, um, segments. And we, we then take the industries that most rely on them. So for example, we know that coal or lumber or wheat, it, it basically only goes on, on dry bulk shipping. Whereas uh, um, say computer components uh, or uh, as imports to Russia, uh, importantly, because that's the other part here, we would also ban the imports into Russia or make them hard um, with high shipping costs. So that would go on containers. And so we've been very careful in trying to discern them, but we chose not to emphasize it as much as I mentioned these kind of fine tuned uh, simulations. The important takeaway is that with a baseline increase in transport costs across the board uh, of 10%, and then some little add-ons, you easily get GDP uh, numbers, uh, drops in Russian GDP that go towards uh, higher magnitudes than the other measures did so far. Why? Well, it also affects the imports into Russia. And two, that's the most important part, it is broad-based. Every industry is affected. So the Russian economy's flexibility doesn't really get to go to work because everything's jointly affected. And the, uh, uh, it, it affects all countries shipping or not, except for the landlocked, uh, or I shouldn't say landlocked, the, la the land neighbors uh, uh, to Russia, including China and, and the Stans just south of it. So um, that's how we approached it. And as I said, in the model, we cannot discern trade flow by mode, by shipping mode directly. We can only say which industries most likely rely on this kind of shipping mode in, 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 in the global perspective. Good, and that's, that's that. Um, Simon, you should take over. 
Thank you. So let me say a little bit more about the South African precedent and the Russian uh, current situation. So the current situation with respect to Russia, we have some global shipping companies saying they will not take stuff to uh, to Russian ports. Uh, we have um, some of the the uh, you know, better industry so publications showing in, intra-European shipping costs to uh, from Western Europe to Russia rising in the range of 40 to 50 percent uh, already. Um, so these are uh, numbers which you can then use that to benchmark about again compared to what we have already done. Uh, now let's contrast that a little bit to what happened in South Africa, which was the precedent case we researched. There the story seems to have been that the trade sanctions and, and perhaps more the financial sanctions led to a drying up of exports to, uh, to, um, to South Africa and, um, uh, and uh, shipments from South Africa, so much so that the, uh, you know, the, the size of the ships which eventually got to South Africa and the like became much smaller and the economies of scale were lost. And this is what helped push up significantly the transport costs. So you have a more nuanced story about how sanctions led to less trade and then to higher transportation costs. Here in, in the Russian case, I think we have an even more uh, you know, a stricter uh, case where we have withdrawal of supply and some um, evidence of higher transportation costs increases which are in excess of what they saw in South Africa. And so I think that suggests that the ranges that we simulated are, are probably on the low end of what uh, what is possible and that you know the two to four percent GDP losses are entirely uh, plausible. Okay, thank you. Um, let me kind of summarize a, a couple questions about export controls that are in the in the Q and A here. Um, so, the, and I think the question is essentially a lot of countries, the United States, for example, have sort of put in different kinds of export controls and export bans. Uh, a, a good example would be trying to limit the uh, semiconductor chips uh, that Russia is able to obtain from the U.S. and other Western countries. Uh, with the idea being that these are obviously essential inputs, uh, in, in some cases for military technology, uh, and and all, but also just for you know many other you know computing devices and things like that. So, are you able, because you have all these input output linkages built into the model, to think about what these export controls may mean for Russia, or is is the flexibility high enough that maybe they they can get these inputs somewhere else uh, and, and ultimately adjust? Maybe I can stop at there. So let's be clear, and this I think will also help um, answer one of Rene's points as well, which is the in the Western sanctions that we considered were all on the import side. So we looked at the uh, tariffs on uh, on Russian exports. We could, of course, try and model the export uh, the impact of uh, Western export sanctions on Russia too, and that would, of course, add um, to the GDP uh, losses. But here is the the but and the sting in the tail is please don't forget that when Russia annexed Crimea in 2014, many of the sanctions put in place at the time were exactly in the technologies which were thought to um, make uh, Russian, the Russian oil extraction sector and gas ex extraction sector more productive. And it's not particularly evident that those sanctions have had much of an effect. So uh, you, get an, you get a partial answer to your question, Carl, uh, but uh, with some doubts based on, on prior experience. So um, <clears throat> let me take another question from the, the Q&A here, uh, and I'm going to elaborate on it a little bit. But uh, the question is about the China cutting coal import tariffs to zero and whether this would affect Russia and the rest of the world. But to, to kind of elaborate on that in a way that I think is important about kind of the sustainability of these sanctions, um, one thing that China did in response to the the U.S. tariffs on China and the U.S.-China trade wars, while they were increasing tariffs on the U.S. to 25 or 30 percent, they were reducing tariffs, uh, their most favored nation rates against everyone else. Um, and so is, is there some, I don't know if you modeled this or thought about it, is it possible that we could sort of divert a lot of trade away from Russia if these sanctioning countries actually simultaneously reduced uh, their tariffs against other countries? And if that would you know, maybe make this more sustainable or increase the harm uh, that it would have on Russia. Uh, 
I can I can take this one. I, I get a lawnmower close by to my home office here, so I hope that it, the sound doesn't disturb. The, let me show you um, a, a graph here as to how relevant Russian oil and gas, it's not coal precisely, but oil and gas is for certain countries. So all the ones in gray here do not have any Russian oil and gas shipment. Interestingly, <laughs> Libya and Algeria do receive Russian gas and oil. I do not know why, but they do according to the data. And then China, this was the most stunning to me, is not really highly reliant on Russian oil and gas. It also goes maybe to Victor Xi's point in the, in the chat. Um, China seems to be extremely diversified in its import source. And um, it, is, it is much less dependent. Um, so now on trade diversion, one of the other stunning features of this graph is we can, in these data, we have production data. That's the crucial part of, for simulation. So we know how much Russia actually buys oil and gas from itself. It imports oil and gas in, in addition. So actually Russia is less dependent on its own oil and gas than some of its Eastern European neighbors. Uh, um, uh, partly also because of Russia's energy mix into its nuclear fuels and a lot of extent. So Belarus, Poland, the, the Baltic countries are highly dependent on Russian oil and gas. So what now about trade diversion? Well, um, um, two channels, and we see that in the simulations. The, if, if Russian oil and gas is banned from only a select group of countries, and that's very different from our trade transport cost simulation, which would affect all countries pretty similarly. If it were diverted by single countries and banning it, um, where would it mostly go? Well, arguably to the highly dependent countries to an even hard, larger extent. And then to those countries who are highly diversified, they could absorb easily at the margin a little more. And that's exactly where you see the trade diversion going. So um, the model predicts um, that, uh, that uh, among the products, oil and gas is one of them. Um, the, uh, China is a, is a typical market to absorb it. Now, that is how dependent these countries are on Russia and how dependent Russia is on its own shipments. If you turn it around again, and I think I showed this uh, just before, how relevant are these countries for Russia? Uh, this is for bulk shipments, let's go uh, oil and gas. Um, uh, China is an extremely important customer for Russia. Uh, whereas Russia is not an important supplier for China. Uh, to, to Russia, China is really important, not just in, in oil and gas, it's important in bulk shipments, it's super important for imports of containerized goods. Um, and so, so if you ask about the trade diversion, um, highly dependent countries get a little more and China is arguably, and that goes to Victor Xi's point, uh, most affected, both because it's so important to Russia and because it's so highly diversified so that it can flexibly add and subtract a little from individual suppliers. Mm -hmm. Maybe I'll just add one, um, one more comment there on uh, third countries taking advantage of this situation. Uh, you've probably read in the press reports the deals that uh, India has done with Russia to import lots of oil at significant discounts to the euros uh, pr uh, prices being traded. So uh, we do see um, some countries potentially are benefiting, and this may well account for why uh, some countries have not joined the coalition of sanctioning nations as well. I think let me take one one more question from the chat. It's an interesting point here. Uh, thinking about transport costs, I think due to the COVID nineteen pandemic and also some various supply chain disruptions and stuff have have gone up uh, just worldwide. And uh, the question is is has that you know in the context of the model? I guess this would be kind of an of a you know. It, in the context of the model that you have, um, are you able to kind of model these shipping cost increases, say in the pandemic, and see what their GDP impact might have been? And is it is it kind of in line with what we would expect? So that the the simulations that you're doing here for Russia, you know, it sort of have maybe have some more validity because uh, we can see the model hit the hit the baseline right in the in the past few years. So on the validity, um, we ran in the, in the lab group here, and, and Simon was part of it from the beginning too. Um, we ran simulations of cases that have been out there in literature, just to see how our model responds compared to those. Uh, an important benchmark used to be the US-China trade war. Um, 
And there's a lot of academic publications, different models that have been put to work to simulate it. And we are uh, quite close to the ballpark. And um, these are also these trade war questions are also important because industries have been targeted in certain designed ways. So one was obviously to target voters in the United States by Chinese tariffs. Um, but another one was to target downstream industries, say the ban on semiconductors by the United States to hurt uh, Chinese producers such as Huawei. And the model delivers. So we are rather confident that we get the supply chains pretty well reflected for the group of countries where we can do it with using these WIOD, the wired, uh, world input output data. Um, the, the bigger question uh, on food stuff that Jim raised beyond the semiconductors that you raised, um, on the food stuff, a lot of the most effective countries are in the group for which the WIOD uh, team has not been able to assemble good supply uh, uh, input output data. So there it's much harder, but for semiconductors, I'm rather confident that we can do things. And, and it, it, partly because one of the two of the main uh, suppliers, South Korea and especially Taiwan, they are in the group for which we have supply chain information. Okay, well, I think we're, we're almost to the end here. So I'm gonna wrap up. I wanna thank uh, Mark and Simon uh, for coming on today and doing this uh, webin webinar on this you know, incredibly important topic uh, and answering all our questions. Also just wanna thank you for kind of doing this simulation. I mean, I think this is an incredible tool um, and to be able to, you know, as, as Mark, as you said in your kind of introduction, sort of like hit the button um, and just run all these scenarios uh, is incredible. Um, obviously, people are interested. We've got more questions uh, than, than I can get to, uh, but I would encourage all our attendees today, or if you're watching this later on the recording, uh, I, I think Mark and Simon will probably continue to update this, and they have two briefs already posted. Uh, some of your questions might be answered in, in the briefs. Well, actually, I know they're answered in the briefs because I've read them. Uh, so I encourage you to take a look at that and look at those details and uh, you know, kind of stay tuned. This is definitely you know, a situation that's going to continue to change. And I think uh, there may be more creativity out there, po possibly inspired by, by these sort of simulations. And so it's been great to have you on. And uh, thank you very much uh, for taking the time and uh, answering our questions. Thank you, Kyle. Our pleasure. Um, and to the audience, um, is button ready in many regards. So we are always uh, interested in interesting scenarios to, to work on. So feel free to reach out to Simon and me. Thanks everyone. Thanks Carl for, for doing this and thanks to the CCD uh, team for setting this up. Thank you.